Hi there, welcome back to our video series of building recommendation systems with TensorFlow. My name is Wei, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. In our last video, we gave you an overview of recommendation systems and introduced several cool open source projects from Google to help you build powerful recommenders. In this video, we'll be covering content-based filtering and collaborative filtering. They're traditional recommendation models, but are important concepts in recommendation system literature and will help pave the foundation for more advanced models that we'll be discussing in future episodes. So there are many traditional approaches used to build recommendation systems. One common approach is content-based filtering. Content-based filtering uses item features to recommend other items similar to what a user likes based on previous actions or explicit feedback. For example, here we're illustrating four apps that have different features. Each row represents an app, and each column represents a feature. Some apps are educational or science-related. Some are relevant to health or healthcare. Some are simply time wasters. When a user installs a health app, we can recommend other health-related apps to that user because they are similar to the installed health app. Another common approach is collaborative filtering. One limitation with content-based filtering is that it only leverages item similarities. What if we can use similarities between users and items simultaneously to provide recommendations? This would allow for serendipitous recommendations, namely recommending an item to user A based on the interests of a similar user B. This is what collaborative filtering is able to do, while item-based filtering is not. Here, we're illustrating a feedback matrix of four users and five movies. Each row represents a user, and each column represents a movie. The green check mark means that a user has watched a particular movie. We consider this an implicit feedback. In contrast, if a user gives a rating on the movie, that would be an explicit feedback. So as you can see here, the user in the first row has watched the three movies, Harry Potter, Shrek, and The Dark Knight Rises. Now for the user in the third row, she has also watched Harry Potter and Shrek. So it may make sense to recommend The Dark Knight Rises to her, since the first user has similar preference to her. So that's the idea of collaborative filtering. But how do we do this in practice? Let's say we can assign a value between minus one to one to each user indicating their interest level for children's movies. Minus one means highest level of interest for children's movies, and one means no interest at all. In this case, user number three likes children's movies a lot, and user number four doesn't like children's movies at all. We can also assign a value between minus one to one to each movie. Minus one means the movie is highly suitable for children, and one means it's not for children at all. Now we can see Shrek is really a great movie for children. Now these values become embedding for users and movies, and the product of user embedding and movie embedding should be higher for movies that we expect the user to like. In this example, we hand-engineered the embeddings, and these embeddings are one-dimensional. Now we can say we have another dimension to represent the users and the movies. Let's assign another value between minus one to one to each user, indicating their interest level for blockbuster movies. Similarly, we assign a value between minus one to one to each movie, indicating whether it is blockbuster or not. Now we have hand engineered a second dimension of embeddings. We can go on and add more dimensions if we want. In practice, these embeddings tend to be of much higher dimensions but uh, we can learn those embeddings automatically, which is the beauty of collaborative filtering models. For the sake of user visualization, we're sticking to two dimensions. Here, we're illustrating 2D embeddings for the users and movies on the right. Our goal is to make sure that we can learn these embeddings so that the predicted feedback matrix is as close to the ground truth feedback matrix as possible. Here, we denote user embeddings as U and item embeddings as V. 
the product of u and v is a, which is a predicted feedback matrix. For example, if we take the first row of u, 1.1, and the first column of v, 0 0.9, 0 0.2, and compute the dot product, it gives 0.88, which is the top leftmost element in the predicted feedback matrix. So our optimization objective then becomes minimizing the summation of the squared difference between the feedback label and the predicted feedback, as you can see in the mathematical form in blue. We can solve this using either stochastic gradient descent, SGD, or weighted alternating list of squares, WAS. SGD, I'm sure you have heard about it when you train your net neural networks. SGD is a generic method while was it's specific to this problem. The idea of was is that for each iteration, we alternate between fixing u and solve for v, and then fixing v and solving for u. We won't go into the mathematical details, but I should point out that SGD and was each have their own advantages and disadvantages. For example, was usually converges faster than SGD. While SGD is more flexible and can handle other loss functions. But so far, we only cared about observed item items. What about the unobserved ones? So, observed only matrix factorization is not good, because if you set the embeddings to all ones, you have minimized the objective function, which is clearly not what we want. So, we need to take into account of the unobserved entries. There are two approaches to handle this. First, we can treat all unobserved entries as zero and then solve it using SVD, singular value decomposition. We won't be reviewing linear algebra here, but you should know that SVD is not very good at this because the A matrix tends to be very sparse in practice. So the SVD solution tends to have poor generalization capabilities. A better approach is weighted matrix factorization. In this case, we still treat unobserved entries as zero, but we scale the unobserved part of the object function highlighted in orange so that it's not overweighted. As you can see, the weight W0 is now a hyperparameter you need to tune. Now to sum up, today we first introduced the content-based filtering and then covered collaborative filtering quite a bit. I have listed out a few links of documentation and code implementation of collaborative filtering models based on TensorFlow. These implementations are using TensorFlow core API. In our next video, we'll be introducing you to TensorFlow recommenders, which makes it a lot easier to build recommendation models. See you next time.